today's session um, that you're joining us is with Emma and it's all about how to break into the commercial advertising market. So Emma, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. Hi guys, it's lovely to be here uh, again. I was here last time. Um, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, my name is Emma Alexander. I'm a commercial photography expert um, and I run the production company Mother Brand. Uh, I'm also a creative mentor. Um, Mother Brand's mission is really to support independent photographers to create amazing commercial work. Okay, we do this through production logistics, one-to-one -one mentoring and accountability. Um, and today we're going to be talking about breaking into that commercial sector. So just going to give a little bit of a brief overview of my kind of career. I've worked in the creative industry for, for 17 years. Um, I've worked in syndication and licensing, um, studios. Uh, but over half of my career has been inside advertising agencies um, as an art buyer and a producer, uh, commissioning and producing work for, for a host of kind of household names across the, across the globe. And it was initially through my mentoring work that I began to kind of realise how really rare and, and valuable this knowledge of how advertising agencies work from the inside out. And that is precisely why I'm here today to talk to you through. These are some of the brands that I've worked with over the years. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and um, you know as an art buyer and a producer uh, in advertising I probably got about 20 to 30 emails sometimes a week from independent photographers and agents asking to come in share their work or have a quick phone call uh, to share their portfolios uh, so I understand really as someone who commissions jobs how very difficult it is to actually slash into this um, into this industry so today we're going to be talking about five different steps that you can do uh, you can take to try and really cut through the noise and make an impact in this area so commercial photography what, what do I actually mean when I talk about commercial photography now I am not talking about editorial I think that some of these principles still apply to editorial but I don't work in that sector so not talking about editorial I'm not talking about b2c you know portraits I'm not talking about creative fine art unit stills weddings you know documentary press I am purely talking about commercial work in the sense of um, you know essentially selling essentially commerce it's really important to remember this kind of comes in different guises you know you can have the really product centric work but also some, uh, some campaigns, much larger brand building pieces, but they are all commercially driven. And I think it's really important also to remember that, you know, um, big campaigns are truly 360 in their approach. So, you know, I'm not just talking about the big, big above the line, you know, billboard ads and glossy kind of double magazine spreads. You know, I don't think I need to tell you that social media is a, a massively important channel for, for brands these days to kind of have conversations with their clients. But, you know, also in-store um, displays, um, on pack creative, um, direct mail coupons, you know, it doesn't matter how big or small these jobs are. If an image is, is delivering a brand message, then in my mind, it is commercial work. Um, I remind actually recently one of the first jobs I did when I moved back to the UK from Australia was um, uh, was a job for Tate and Lyle for Pancake Day, very glamorous, and um, you know it ended up being floor media in Morrison's. And when I popped in to see it, people were literally walking all over my work. Um, but you know it was a really important key um, key bit of communication for them. So you know it's, uh, it's a, it doesn't matter how big or how small these jobs are, <coughs> they are all commercial work and they're all commercially viable. So, how do you land these gigs? This is clearly what you want to know, right? When I speak to people about what their process is, you know, what, what are you doing to get this kind of work? They often tell me they are doing, um, obviously, emails, they're reaching out to the, the ad agencies, to the producers there, to the brands directly. You know, they're picking up the phone, they're, they're printing uh, direct mailers and things like that. Um, this is a really horrible diagram, so please excuse my, my terrible PowerPoint presentation skills, but you know, these are the popular things that I hear a lot. Cold emails, cold calling, printed mailers, DMs, you know, and, and obviously PR. Before you print anything, before you pick up the phone, I want you to actually think about one thing, one really, really key thing, and that is you. So what do you do? Like what do you really, really do? 
So my first piece of advice, you know, for anybody trying to get into this sector is to know your niche. And what do you want to be known for? Now, this is not gonna sit well with some of you, I appreciate. Uh, nobody wants to be pigeonholed, I absolutely understand that. And I think there's a feeling generally that if you, if you drill down too much, you know, uh, you're gonna miss out on work. And that is completely understandable, but it's also quite misguided, I think. And I think it's misguided for two reasons. And one is, you know, a USP makes you memorable. This is the way you're going to stand out to the people that matter the most. There are thousands, literally thousands of generic portrait, you know, food, fashion photographers out there. And I say generic, but I'll bet their work actually isn't generic. You know, I'd hazard a guess that some of you probably describe yourself in really broad terms. But I don't think you think your work is being generic. I don't think your work is vanilla. I'd hope not. You know, I reckon uh, you have a star. You have something that really kind of comes through whenever you approach any job. And that's important. Like your work is, is important. So my question is, what kind of makes you special? USP is, you know, unique selling point. What is it that sets you apart from everybody else out there? I'm going to be really brutal to hammer this point home, but there is always somebody else who can probably do as good a job as you. So what is going to make you stand out? And I want you to tell me, you know, as a commissioner, I need you to tell me what it is. I don't have time to try and make connections. I need to be really explicit as to why you are a great fit for me and your brand. And this might be your values or your story as much as your sort of um, visual style or your subject matter. So do you have like a passion for sustainability? Do you kind of focus on you know, creativity or tech for good? Are you someone who works in sports, but you focus on championing uh, women in sports? You know, what is it that actually sets you apart? Find your USP and embrace it. I don't think it's enough to be um, a fashion and portrait photographer. That doesn't, it tells me nothing. It tells me absolutely nothing. So what I want to know is what, what drives you and why do you do what you do? And if you can summarize that in one sentence, then why you're unique, you know, then this is your elevator pitch. This is your USP. The second reason I think not having a niche is uh, sort of misguided is this old adage, which no one wants to hear really, I know. Jack of all trades, master of none. All right. So put yourself in the mind of a commissioner. The pressure for an art buyer or a producer to deliver for their clients and to deliver on the creative vision of the, of the creative team is immense. That pressure is immense. Um, I think everyone knows that where there is commercial work, there is money behind them. Um, that might be why you're here, because there's more money in this than in editorial work. Um, you know, so when big budgets are involved, there is risk. And everybody in this process, from the art buyer, you know, to the creative team and the client, they want this to be the best of the best, even if it is, a stack of pancakes for Pancake Day for Tate and Lyle. They want it to be the best of the best. So I want to work with the best of the best. I don't want to work with a generalist. So, you know, you can probably do most jobs, okay? But as a commissioner, how do I sell in good enough to the client? You know, I can't. I can't go to a client and say, I'm sure they'll have a bash and do a great job. That is not enough. That is not good enough. Um, if, if a client is shooting um, aardvarks, <laughs> they want the person who lives and breathes shooting aardvarks, you know, and um, if it is liquids, you want the person who, who is the go-to person for, for liquids, for spritz, for effervescence, you know, who can really light glass and liquid properly and make that look amazing. You know, if you are shooting some youth culture, you want someone who is genuinely embedded in that culture. And there is a risk that if you spread yourself too thinly, you are perceived as a jack of all trades, master of none, and you land nothing. You're not, you're not cutting out work, you're landing nothing, okay? Commissioners are, like I said before, typically time poor, okay? So you have to tell them, like I said before, very explicitly why you are a great fit. So think about what really drives you and then own that niche. I want you to be the best of the best of that thing. Know it inside out. And I'm not saying you can't shoot other things. Of course you can. Of course you can do other things. But I think when you're talking about yourself, when you're presenting your work, find a niche and own it. Um, 
here's an example of that. I have a friend uh, in South Africa who has made a real name for herself as a dog photographer. She started as a portrait photographer and moved into dogs, black dogs, which I don't think you get much more niche than that. Um, <laughs> she shoots all kinds of commercial work now, um, including people, but she is known as the woman who shoots black dogs and it has set her apart. She's done a TEDx talk, her, her work has gone uh, viral, it's been on board Panda, but she got that because she saw a niche, she stepped in and she owns it. And that in turn has opened doors to other things. So like I say, doesn't mean you can't shoot other things, that's fine, but be clear on what sets you apart and how you present that. And just an extension of this, I, um, I really feel that having a niche actually can help support your mindset as well. I don't have time to go into the mindset and psychology here, but I find that when I work one-to-one uh, -one with clients, one-to-one -one mentoring, quite often the problems they're bringing, when we unpick them, they're not about clients, they're about confidence. So actually when you have a niche and you really understand it and you really understand where you sit within that and you own that niche, you become the expert in your field, then actually it gives you an amazing confidence and you feel like you belong. That imposter syndrome, you can put that to one side because this is your space and you own it. So I cannot underestimate um, the, the power of really owning a niche. Um, but also know your peers. As part of this notice i don't say competitors here i genuinely believe in community over competition so i'm gonna say peers but understanding who else is doing what you do is really interesting you know um it's very cheesy to say this uh but nobody else can do you such an overused millennial phrase but no one else can do you yeah this is your usp so if you're genuinely bringing your your eye your experience your value your history and your creative language to the table why should there not be room for us all and i understand that there are not an infinite number of jobs i appreciate that but so much of build, breaking into this um this sector is about building relationships so no one person is going to be compatible with every client so finding your space and being aware of who else is out there is really important. You know, how do your peers talk about themselves? Uh, what is their USP? What is your perceived, what, what do you perceive to be their USP? What is the value they bring? You know, and don't emulate them. Don't try and be anything you're not, but, you know, um, craft your space and sit alongside them and be confident in that space. You know, you <coughs> so, We've gone in, we've gone in full pal. We have a lot to get through. So we've, uh, you know, you have a unique offering. You have worked out what your USP is. You've summarized it in one sentence. You know the value you bring. Here are your clients. Number two, knowing your ideal clients. And without wanting to sound too kind of businessy, you know, customer profiling is, is really, really important. Because to stand out to a client, you need to bring a solution to their problem, essentially. That is what we're doing at the end of the day. It's not enough to have, you know, lovely, lovely work. You know, I go to a gallery for that or I lose myself in the rabbit warren of Instagram for lovely, lovely work. Advertising art buyers are marketing managers, you know, at brands directly. They are invariably, like I said before, very, very busy people. So you need to present them something, you know, of value. And I want you to always think about this value. What is the value you're bringing? I'm going to talk about this a lot, but, you know, at its core, when you're pitching your work to someone, you are essentially, you know, you're presenting a solution to the client's problem. Um, so drill down on who your absolute dream clients are. You know, uh, have a massive brainstorm, prioritize your favorites, and then get to know them. What campaigns made you go, I really wish I'd shot that. I could have done an amazing job at that. I want you to pick five ideal clients and ask yourself, what do you love about them? You know, um, what would you bring to them? And then research, research, research. Think about their previous campaigns, what channels they use, like how do they speak to their audience? What is their tone of voice? What kind of language they use? Get under the skin of those clients and, and know them really well because you're gonna need that information when you start to reach out to them. But before you do that, it's actually time to do a really quick 180 and make sure that the work that you are making is really aligned uh, with your clients. And I call this, well, leading with the work you want to attract. So make the work you want. 
make the work you want to be commissioned for. This is a complete no brainer, but it's, it's really funny how many, so many of us actually miss this mark. So if you, um, if you head to the mother brand Instagram, you will see a little square that looks like this leading with the work you want to attract. It's like a 15 minute exercise to help you drill down on who your ideal clients are and make sure you are leading with work that speaks to them. Essentially you take your top five clients and then switch your objective brain on, you know, put yourself in the client's shoes again and ask yourself genuinely, does this work? Does my work speak the language of this brand, these clients, the clients that I want? Are you showing work that solves their problem? You know, are you leading with the work that you want to attract? And a great, you know, this is not kind of fluffy, woo-woo, um, laws of attraction kind of thing. This isn't manifesting. It is really simply looking at all your outward facing touch points with the mindset of your, of your target clients and then being really brutal. So I want you to cut the work that does not feed your vision and then test the work. Uh, so shoot to fill the holes. So this is either, um, you know, test shoots or, or personal work, um, <coughs> but fill those holes. If you are, um, if you really want to work with outdoor brands, action brands, you know, the North Face, um, Berghaus, people like that, you know, Absolutely, you can shoot portraits, you can shoot uh, landscapes, but look at the work they're making and make sure that the first work that you show really speaks to this kind of outdoor adventure, you know, language. And if you need to go and shoot things to fill that, go and do it. Like, don't wait for someone to commission you, go and do it. I cannot express the importance of personal work. I believe no matter how big you are, personal work is so important. And invariably, um, when I look at portfolios, I spend more and more time looking at personal work and talking about it than I do commission things. Because um, one, the photographers are generally much more passionate about their personal work. You know, you get more excited about it, much more into it. Um, and two, I think it shows you, um, it shows me a couple of things. It shows me that you love your craft as well. <clears throat> it shows me that you are as excited about um, photography that you're gonna to want to go and actually, you know, um, find these stories yourself. I don't wanna work for a gun for hire. I wanna bring someone in my team who is genuinely as passionate about photography as I am. So it shows me that you love your craft. And secondly, you know, it shows me what you would do if you had no brief. And that is really important. What is your true eye? Because commercial work, advertising work is always essentially, it's, you're bringing your eye, but you're, you're shooting someone else's idea. You don't have as much creative control like you do with editorial work in the commercial sector. So, you know, if you need to fill those holes, just go and make it happen. Don't wait to be invited. So this is the bit probably you've been waiting for. How do you make content? How do you reach out? Um, and I'm really sorry to say there is no big reveal here. You actually know how to do this already. If you've been using email at any point in your life or picked up a phone, you probably know how to do this. Um, however, if you, truly understand your client's brand, if you truly understand your value, your USP, and you understand how these things fit together and you can articulate this, then the rest is easy, <laughs> essentially. But keep these, um, <coughs> so the issues come uh, when you try and sort of mass email everybody, that doesn't happen. Like this, this mass appeal, spray and pray, doesn't work. Or when you try and sort of retrofit your um, your work into a client that you you know you're not really embedded in, they will see through it. Commissions will see through it, and it just falls on deaf ears. Okay, you need to visually demonstrate that you can uh, that you understand the brand and that you you are a general fit. So these three things are going to really help when you're sending out emails. Okay, keep it short. Keep it super short. No one's going to read a long email. I absolutely guarantee you. Uh, so keep it super short make it personal you know no one wants to be a number so just take a, a minute to, to show that you like the brand you know um tell them what you liked about the last campaign you did congratulate them on a a win a launch a bit of pr but you know bit, you know a bit of flattery goes a long way um and demonstrate value this is the fit we talked about you know leading with the work you want to attract if you're sending a, a one-page um uh, 
sort of PDF of images, tailor them to that client. All these are shortcuts to say, I understand your brand, I understand your audience, and I am a really good fit for you. And those are the things that are gonna give you standout where, where a generic kind of newsletter is gonna fall flat. Uh, keep it really short, let your work do the, do the talking, but crucially, add in a call to action, a CTA. Ask them, tell them what you want. Tell me what you want me to do with this. You've sent me something amazing, fantastic. I'm probably not ready to commission you right now. Tell me what you want me to do. Do you want a phone call? Do you want a Zoom call to go through your folio? Or, here's the killer line, please consider me for your next shoot. Groundbreaking stuff. Tell me what you want me to do. It's really that simple. And finally, follow up. You know, we are super busy. I keep saying that commissioners are so busy. Follow up once, twice. If you don't hear anything else, park it. But feel free to follow up when you have something new to share that is genuinely aligned with their brand. You know, if you are, are, if you are showing, if you're selling something of value to them, it's not a pest. You're not a pest if it's relevant. You know, but breaking into this uh, into this sector, it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. It is not going to happen overnight. You know, it is really is about um, the longevity and the long game. And we said at the very beginning, that, you know, clients want to work with the very best of the best. And really, that is all about trust. So they need to trust that you will do a great job for them, that you understand um, their needs, you know, and that you can translate that, that you can solve their problem. So the first email, that is the start of a relationship and it's the start of building trust. So how do you, how do you build a relationship when it's a one-way thing? <laughs> when you're just sending emails, how does that develop into a relationship? By being visible. So visibility is not just um, one cold email sent on a rainy Tuesday afternoon, you know? How many times have you had an email through and gone, this is it, this is the thing I've been waiting for, I'm gonna buy, da, 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 da. You know, it happens, but it rarely, you know? There's, um, there's an old marketing um, like statistic from the 30s that's called the rule of seven. It basically says, customer needs to see a product seven times, hang on, is that right? Seven times <laughs> before they're ready to buy, okay? And in this instance, you are the product and the brand is the customer or the ad agency is the customer. So do you need to send seven emails? Well, not really, actually, to increase your visibility, you know, sorry, increase your chances, actually, you need to diversify your, your visibility. So where do your customers sit? Where do they play? You know, what do they read? Where do they operate? Where are they? Be in their space. And this might be, you know, things like, um, this might be things like social media, <coughs> um, I mean, LinkedIn. Here are some of the places that you could think of. Podcast, could be a podcast guest, guest blogs, uh, opinion pieces. You as the case study PR, you know, do you have something? Can you utilize your USP to actually do a bit of PR? Awards, entering and judging. Uh, for exposure. What about guest curating? Can you guest curate uh, an exhibition for, I don't know, um, a social media channel? Do you do talks like this? Collaborations, exhibitions, social media, SEO. Are you genuinely geared to drive all the traffic using landing um, search terms that actually hark to your USP? These are all ways that you can think of actually increasing your visibility. It doesn't have to be going on Instagram Live if that just makes you cringe. That's fine. But can you use things like LinkedIn? You know, they um, invariably commissioners are on LinkedIn. Can you use that to to, to solidify your opinion, to show your uh, your thought process and establish yourself again as the expert in your field? When people start seeing your name coming up again and again and again, it it triggers this kind of um, uh, familiarity, you know, relationships built on trust and visibility builds trust. It is familiarity. It reinforces you as the expert in your field, allows you to demonstrate your weakness. It's, it's, you know, it's your opinion, it's your skill, it's your values, it's your creative vision. It's all the things that set you apart from your peers. You said that's the box. So I want you to think outside the box for this. I want you to think how creatively, this is a great book if you haven't read it, being humble. It's time to actually, you know, celebrate and share your wins. It's not a time for sitting back and being recessive and waiting for people to come to you. You actually need to share your wins. Doesn't need to be face to face. You know, you can literally put something on, say on LinkedIn, but share your work, 
talk about it, talk about the process behind it, allow people to get to know you as a, as a commissioner and a creative. So that was a complete whirlwind whistle stop tour through ways to get in front of um, uh, the people who matter, the people you want. In summary, know your niche, own your niche, understand what makes you really special. Okay, identify your target clients, uh, understand, start with five, don't overwhelm yourself, a handful of clients, research them and then target them. Make sure you are always leading with the work you want to attract. Then reach out with impact. You've done the research, you know why you're a great fit, you're already articulating this, go and get them and then support that with wider visibility. Um, there is no magic trick, unfortunately. There is no magic kind of shortcut to getting to getting this work. I think these five steps are a great way to getting yourself um, uh, much more visible and in front of the people who really, really matter and who are really, really aligned for you. Um, if uh, I have, oopsie, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> I am going to be doing Q and A's um, over on the uh, photography show uh, site. Um, if you have any questions or follow-ups, you can find me here. I'm at Mother Brown uh, on Instagram and Twitter, and obviously motherbrown.com down the bottom. Um, I run we, uh, fortnightly accountability sessions, uh, which are two-week sprints of activity. So if you want to try and action any of the points that you've seen here today, but need to be held accountable, uh, we have one starting on Thursday, and we have more uh, every fortnight they are released. They're, they're small group mentoring sessions where you can say try and uh, with the support of others, hold yourself accountable. And of course, I do offer one-to-one -one mentoring uh, for anybody who really wants to take a deep dive into their uh, position and get a bit more support. So um, thank you so much for having me today and listening. I know we have rattled through this at a breakneck speed. I hope there's been something that you can take away and implement into your own career and your own mindset. Um, I'm going to be jumping over onto the Q&A now and uh, I'm going to open it up and answering some questions live. So, Luca, I'm currently a photography student, 17. I have a website offering design and photographic services. When would you say the best time to register as a business? Uh, oh, my God, I don't know. Um, I would say now. I mean, registering as a business is not... Um, uh, you don't need to pay. Oh, my God, I don't know. That's a bit of a tricky one. <laughs> I would say it sooner rather than later, because ultimately, as soon as you get a commission, you're going to need to be set up to, you know, to, to take that work. So I would say go, go now. Um, whether it's sole trader or limited is a really good question. Somebody had a really good um, piece on that on Instagram the other day. I'll repost that on my Instagram post. I did a, did a story about it. Uh, but I would say now get set up as a sole trader and be ready to, um, ready to go. Um, Matt Walker, when you say niche, I often shoot uh, more colorful and contrasty images during summer compared to the winter. Would I be better sticking to one thing compared to the changing season? Um, I don't know, that's a really interesting question. I think absolutely your, um, your eye will change, your eye will change with um, kind of as you grow. Someone was talking the other day about you know, growing as, as, a, as a person and changing. Um, I would say um, think less about your visual style and more about what you are shooting and and what it is that you're shooting and just leading with that describing that i'd love to know actually if you're still on i'd love to know what what you actually shoot what your um uh what your content is um really curious to to hear that um nadia as a portrait photographer i'm interested in getting into commercial does that um it's easy and requires being precise when you try a variety of photographic genres, uh, do you find that your niche doesn't that make commissions run away from you? Um, well, no, I hope I've covered that off, actually. I hope, you know, I don't think that, um, I don't think commissions run away from you. No, I think if you are owning a space, I think it's really important to have, um, to have a kind of, to be able to have a niche. As a portrait photographer, I mean, I would drill down on what you are, looking at what what is the difference that you kind of you show as a portrait photographer um do you focus on stories you know do you focus on real people is it about um i don't know is it a particular type of person or is it a particular area that you're looking at you know portrait is so broad um when i think of portrait photographer, i can think of like 30 different people all with incredibly different styles so you know it doesn't mean you can't shoot 
other things, but I would really try and drill, drill down on what it is that's really important for you and, and what makes you tick. Think about a commissioner trying to find a photographer for, you know, for a job. Um, what are they looking for? They don't just go to Google and put in portrait photographer. They put in, you know, they look for real elements of sentiment. You know, who, who is delivering this? Who is, who is looking at families? Who is kind of, um, I don't know, who is kind of looking in, in certain key words, I suppose. So I'd ask you to really go back to what it is that you want your work to say, what, what, how you want to kind of, what point you want to get across, um, and then going back that way. Uh, if I want to work for M&S or Adidas, do I have to particularly use their products? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, I don't think you have to necessarily use their products. Um, I think I would think about the language, the tone of language that they are um, running with. So Adidas, for example, absolutely, you don't need to necessarily have Adidas products. I would say as long as you're showing, um, think about the fundamentals. It's about sport. It's about drive. You know, it's about grit and determination and focus about pushing through boundaries if you can show those things in your work they can be wearing you know sports direct it literally doesn't matter it's about how you are um delivering that message and that brand message same with MS. if you think about uh some of the family work they do it's about giving that message of um i guess you know togetherness or uh, depending kind of which part you're looking for um what is the what is the brand message they're trying to land there what is the the particular um hook that they want to land and actually it's it's the shortcut to that sentiment rather than actually presenting the products that makes sense um if you were a beauty photographer or still life sorry still life beauty um absolutely go and get that person's products or even you know with this but i think it's really about your portfolio showing your skill showing your eye and showing your point of difference that makes sense uh cool i think we have about five minutes left if anyone has any other um questions that'll do those quite no fantastic okay oh sorry i keep going okay oh gosh there we go right there's a ton of questions that come through, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, thank you, Lizzie. Um, you mentioned uh, a Charlotte Gale, you mentioned a, a one page PDF to showcase your work. Would you recommend this? Um, I would hyperlink to your, to your work, but um, doing a PDF and just a one pager actually allows you to really tailor it for that client. And I think you should be tailoring that every time for every client because every client it's not a one size fits all you are um you are you know the solution you're providing a solution for that client's problem okay so if you think about it in that that way everyone has a slightly different um uh a slightly different focus slightly different drive for their brand so i would be tweaking that um and i would just do something like you know if you've got illustrator fine i use like google docs really simple um and just swap out images but um one thing i would say is always put your contact details on a pdf it's very easy to get deta detached uh, from your uh from your email and get lost sometimes in ad agencies we used to have these big folders we drag you know photographers um things into and we'd rename the file but if anything ever happened you need to be able to trace it back so always have your contact details in there um in the case someone forwards it on to somebody else but yeah i would be one page pdf and a hyperlink to your website but your website's going to have a broad range of work in it and you want to really be showing down a drill down um, section of that specifically for this client. Um, Lizzie, regarding website and importance of personal work as well as client groups, how do you recommend presenting them? Um, I hate classical photographers' websites. Um, good question. Uh, actually, I had a conversation with someone about this recently about whether it would be um, they should integrate their commercial work um, or keep it separate. They're, and I think we actually, in the end, we decided for this particular person that having a landing, an overview kind of page would allow them to um, link in their, um, what do you call it, kind of a, a, do an edit that had both personal and commissioned work together that really spoke to their target client, 
really spoke to that that ideal specific client they wanted to to do to, to target and then on the rest of the website they had some personal projects and their commissioned work separate um and the reason having projects split out was that some projects are much more long running it depends on your own work some you know some personal work is just test shoots that's fine but some people's personal work are these sort of longer running projects and actually you want to show them as a body of work and that is absolutely fine absolutely fine in terms of finding a, a website format that works for you you know this is your website you don't have to harp to what anybody else is doing you know screw convention do what you want to do if you want to have everything lumped in together great if you think that's the best way to communicate to your clients and again i'm always working back to what are you saying to someone that lands on your website what are you communicating what are they taking away from that and if it is not um you know a really unified message about uh, what you the work that you want to be making um, then think about how you can rejig that to uh, to make that clearer um, James hello James um, I know James. Um, I shoot with a, a similar style and a couple of niches it's acceptable to push a couple of niches um, yeah I, I guess it depends on what they are um, how how different they are but yeah absolutely I mean I think if they are kind of um, well, sorry just refreshing a bit I think it depends on what the niches are. If you can um, elaborate a little bit on that, that would be great. But I think, um, yeah, I don't know, actually. I was going to say, I don't know unless you, if you can elaborate on that, that'd be great. I'd love to pick up with you about that, actually. Um, I'm trying to think about your work because I know your work and I'm trying to get second guess what you might be asking. So pop more details in and I'll come back to you. Um, oh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Matt Walker, I usually shoot landscapes, uh, wildlife, and macro. When I look at summer, uh, contrast image during the summer yeah i think i think actually matt i'd say if you're shooting uh landscapes and wildlife i wonder if your um your sort of usp could be something around you know is it why are you interested in wildlife why are you interested in landscapes is it actually around uh sustainability is it just curiosity at the natural world i wonder if that uh, and this macro element is is really interesting like I, I you know I, I do landscapes but I also drill down on the macro detail that's a really interesting niche to be to sort of present that so I think your um your niche would less be about this uh the, the look and feel of it perhaps so you can shoot beautifully summery uh, bright images in the summer but then you know darker uh, images in the winter that's fine but what is your subject matter and what really makes you unique because I think actually there's three things that you put together there that already will make you stand out you're not just a landscape photographer you're also looking at the you know what um, the activity within that landscape right down to a really granular level and that that's super exciting i think um how can we contact you to access the offer? thank you erica well if you head to my website motherbrown.com um in the uh in the services section there's my production uh support so i do ad hoc production if you have a, a job that comes in you need ad hoc support uh i have a, a whole production company that that we uh, that we offer production logistics um and then obviously our mentoring's in there and uh, accountability as well uh gavin do you think niches are commercially sustainable once you get beyond the big market segments um it's a tricky one isn't it i think um i was actually thinking about this earlier like ranking doesn't have a Franklin doesn't have to have a niche, does he? <laughs> Everyone knows what he does, and he can call himself just a portrait photographer now. That's fine. But I think that's because you have a real sense of his style already. He's so well known. Um, I think really when you're trying to break into the sector, owning and, and, and have a whole new niche, um, I think is actually really important. It's what's going to give you the standout. Um, so yes, when you get big enough to not need it, great that's what a wonderful position to be in um but at the moment i would say if you're still trying to get into that that's so well known um, that then um uh yeah if you're still trying to break into that niche i think it I just i personally think it's a really important thing um and like i say you don't have to it doesn't mean you can never shoot other things i just think it's about how you uh make that first point of contact that first introduction to a brand or to an ad agency how do you get that cut through i don't remember portrait photographers you know like i do but i don't and i do but um but i might remember someone who said i you know i focus on i'm, I'm a sports photographer and i focus on championing women you know it's not this person doesn't uh, ever shoot a man you know it's just that that's stuck in my brain as being something that she's um uh you know almost like her ethics and her values have stuck in my mind and actually i'm more likely to remember that person than i'm someone who just said hi i'm a portrait and fashion photographer 
mm, you know, portrait of fashion photographer who works with youth culture, who works with, um, I don't know, like, uh, gosh, thinking of my feet now, but, you know, what works in a much more targeted area is going to stick in my brain. And then I can make the leap as to whether my particular brief is going to be suitable for them. But, you know, that, that's why I keep saying niche is, is, is quite important to drill down on. Um, Dave has come back. Brilliant. So better to focus on separate niches than being a jack of trades. Absolutely. Luxury lifestyle, aspirational images. So lingerie and swimwear, fashion and property. Gosh, yeah, that is a big, that is a big broad range. I remember that now. Um, so I would say if, so you're already pitching yourself as very premium, James. You're already pitching yourself as, you know, your, your USP is that you take um, very high-end luxury, you know, uh, items or, 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 sorry, elements and brands. Um, so you're not doing high volume, low cost. You are very much in this prestige um, area. So I think the language you need to be using is around that, you know, luxury, um, luxury, prestige kind of aspirational products. Um, Laundry and swimmer and then fashion and property. Um, yeah, I think you could probably describe yourself. Gosh, how do you, the property feels a bit kind of odd, doesn't it? <laughs> Everything else sits together. Laundry and swimmer and fashion kind of sit within this one thing. The property feels a bit, um, a bit of a sidearm for me. Um, so I'd have to go back to your website and have a look and see how that actually all sat together. Um, but certainly I think you could, uh, you could definitely get a um you could sorry i'm just refreshing my thing <laughs> you could definitely um think about some um think about your ideal clients again and then work backwards to see um what kind of keywords come up when you think about those clients um what are the you know what are the key who are your target who do you who are your dream clients and actually is property even in there because if it's not then maybe you park that as work that you have done it's previous commission work, but you rejig it so you're actually leading with the other work. So maybe think about the, the work that you want to attract. What do you actually really love shooting? Is it property or is it these other elements? Uh, and then sort of work backtrack from that. Your USP will come from the things that um, that you want to attract. That makes sense. Okay, just do a quick refresh. Are we almost, are we almost out of time? Oh no, we've gone over, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Sophie, I didn't see your thing come up. Ah. Now, any more questions, pop them in. I will continue to access through the day so I can keep coming back to anybody who's, um, who's got questions. Great. Thank you much for having me. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>